Good afternoon. My name is Cecilia Rouse and I'm the Dean here at the Woodrow Wilson School. We're thrilled to welcome you to From the Front Lines Lessons in Leadership with retired General Stanley McChrystal. We're also extremely lucky to have Evan Thomas, an author, former Washington bureau chief and editor-at-large editor of Newsweek magazine, who has agreed to moderate today's conversation. Evan, I'll turn it over to you for further introductions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, General McChrystal was at the pointy edge of the spear for a long time, more than 30 years, uh, West Pointer, paratrooper, ranger, uh, head of uh, Joint Special Operations Command, and he ran the effort against uh, radical Islam in Iraq uh, that finally got uh, Zarqawi, uh, the head of uh, uh, Al-Qaeda uh, Al in Iraq, um, and knows a lot about special operations. Uh, then went to be the head of all US and allied uh, troops in Afghanistan fighting the Taliban, uh, somebody who really knows what he's talking about when it comes to fighting radical Islam. So I'll, I'm going to ask him about how we fight uh, ISIS, how we fight the Islamic uh, State. But before I do that, I want to take a step back and talk, to, talk just for a bit uh, with General McChrystal about why we're in the Middle East at all. What, what, what's our goal? Why are we, if it's such a painful place as it has been for us, and it has cost us so much in lives and treasure, Let's just talk for a second about what we're doing here, what our, and what our, what our goals are. General? It, if I could, Edmund, start by thanking everybody for letting me be here. I've had three just sort of magical days here, and this is a little bit intimidating, if you haven't ever been. <laughs> you know, I'm at the Woodrow Wilson School. I got heads of previous speakers on polls out, out front of me. <laughs> <laughs> a, a couple of years ago, I. I got to go to Oxford and speak, and that is equally scary. And they take you in this side room, and it's stone and wood, and, and they tell you the history of Oxford and how it's older than our country and whatnot. And then <laughs> as you walk out, they walk you out toward the, the main area you're going to speak, and they stop at this old photograph, and it's a picture of Theodore Roosevelt. And it's him speaking exactly where I'm about to speak. And the message is, you are not Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> so I went in to speak. And as soon as I started, with my first sentence, somebody right in my front fell asleep. <laughs> and if you haven't ever had that happen, that's very disconcerting. And you try to avoid eye contact with them so you look around. But you keep looking back to see <laughs> something you said woke them up. And that person is here, so my wife is right up there, so. <laughs> so if anybody sees her nodding, tap her on the side of the head if you would. But no, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. You know, why we're in the Mideast, you could start and say sort of the history book reasons. We're in the Mideast because really in the 19th century, we figured out it was there. In the 20th century is the erosion of European dominance there, the rise of things like oil and, and the rise of the state of uh, Israel left a vacuum that caused the United States to become a major player. And then we became a major consumer of oil as American oil dominance uh, waned. Uh, and we became sort of, as we thought, mentally, emotionally, and financially tied to the region. And so we were tied from a bunch of things. And for most of my military career, uh, I was at West Point in 1973 on the first oil shock, and many of us can remember that. That was a visceral, frightening thing. And for most of my life, the idea that gasoline wasn't going to be available was this thing lurking over the shoulder of Americans. And we always thought, well, if we didn't have access to oil, we wouldn't have gasoline. If we didn't have gasoline, we wouldn't have personal freedom, whatever we do. And so we got this tie to the region that was deeper than I think anybody would have expected. So we are there uh, for lots of reasons. I think we are now reassessing what the region means to us. There, clearly, we're knocking on the door of energy independence, and that's going to weaken people's emotional and economic ties to the region. We are, uh, we burned our hands touching the stove in, in the last decade, and so I think we sort of recoiled. And so I think people are doing a recalculation of why would we bother to be there? They don't seem to want us. They don't seem to react to, to our either help or coercion. So shouldn't we be away? And, and my short answer to your very good question is, 
because the world's too small not to be engaged anymore. It is possible, maybe some point in history, to, to have places that are over there. And if you pretend they're not there, it kind of doesn't matter. I don't think there's any over there in the world anymore, particularly in, in that region. So we are still an essential nation in the region, so I think our engagement at various levels, and I'm not arguing for big military engagement, I'm saying active engagement, I think, is necessary. So suppose we did basically nothing about ISIL or ISIS or Islamic State. Let's decide what to call it. We're going to call it ISIS. ISIS. We'll call it ISIS. What, suppose we did nothing about ISIS. We, like we, we, we wish them not well, but we didn't do anything. What, what would happen? Apparently, that course of action was one of those put in front of the, the president about a month ago. It, here is actually a course of action, do nothing. The problem is ISIS is not a movement that is a special thing. And I would even argue ISIS is not a crisis for the United States because it's not going to change our way of life if we don't do something right away. ISIS is a symptom. ISIS is a reaction to the fact that the very uh, structures the that the volume down here is kind of low. I have it all the way up. Is there a way you can turn if it If we think down? about it, there's no unifying narrative in the Mideast. There's no pan-Arab nationalism. There's no Gabal Abdur Nasser. There's no statesmen that we can name that are leading the, the region in a single area. And in this entropy or chaos, you have the rise of ISIS. And I don't think ISIS is a long-term I don't think they're in danger of really establishing an Islamic caliphate that will go out. But they are a symptom of a weakened structure, a weakened region that's pretty dangerous. What we really be looking at is how could the region be this weak now that allows an organization like ISIS to get this kind of traction? That's scary. Now, in the near term, we've got to stop them from some of what they're doing because they're, they are run a bit amok. I mean, they really are threatening the survival of places like uh, Iraq. So we've got to stop that. But hopefully we won't focus on the flame when we focus on the problem, the real problem. Just for the flame for a second, how could they knock off, I mean, could they knock off Baghdad? Could they, how much of a threat to Iraq are they? Really? Yeah, I don't think they could knock off Baghdad simply because the Shia are a little bit like a spring now. They've been pushed back onto themselves. And so the combination of the Iraqi military and the Shia militia and others, I don't think that they but they can terrify Baghdad, and they can undercut the very uh, logic of Iraq being a state. Because if they can control enough of Anbar, and they can control enough of the north, then the, then the writ of governance that Baghdad theoretically controls over the country really comes into question. And if the Sunni parts of the population are enough under either the control or the influence of ISIS, then it starts to make the government that, that emanates from Baghdad look impotent. So I think that they threaten it that way. They threaten its credibility more than right now its, uh, its survival. Are they a threat to the homeland of the United States? Well, I think they would like to be. And in one-off sense, I think they could be. I think we're, they're more likely to uh, create enthusiasm in one or more young people who reside in the United States or in Europe who get a copycat idea and try to do something. I think it's more likely that they'll see that on websites or they'll see it on the television and they'll get the idea to do something criminal. I don't think ISIS, at least in the near term, is likely to project that power. But they, they certainly have the ambition to do that. Do they have the ambition to do it, as Al-Qaeda did, on a grand scale with seizing airline? I mean, something that could kill thousands of people? I, I don't know that they do. And I think that those kinds of plots are so much harder now than 9-11. In fact, our security is pretty good at picking up anything that takes a lot of coordination is much easier to detect. Therefore, the more dangerous attacks now are things which are done by single individuals without much coordination that can still be pretty friendly. Uh, all right, so we have to do something about them, uh, but what? But what's, what's, let's, let's talk militarily here for a second. What's the proper military course of action to contain or degrade or, I'm not sure what verb we should use here, defeat. What is the right military course of action? Um, I, if you do the right military course of action, it has to be built on a strategy. And the strategy has to be built on a desired end state. You're trying to get somewhere. 
So defeating ISIS is not going to be very valuable if the end state after ISIS is something that we're very unhappy with. So, for example, if we go in and focus our efforts and destroy ISIS, and meanwhile Bashar al-Assad destroys the Free Syrian Army, then the players you have left are Bashar al-Assad and potentially al-Nusra, uh, which is another al-Qaeda-related uh, Sunni opposition group. So I think you've got to, it, it's a little bit like chess. You just don't want to move a, a piece and then figure out that you're in a bad place. We've got to make some fundamental decisions on what we want it to be like a move or two in the future. Now, I'm the first to tell you, it's so complex now. Having a perfect game plan is probably too hard for anyone I know. But we've got to be thinking a couple of moves out. I think defeating ISIS, or at least containing ISIS, is not going to be particularly difficult. It's, it's somewhat military. Getting rid of the, the reason for ISIS is going to be a, a longer term problem. And so what are some of the steps, if that's, if that's the bigger problem, how do we focus on that? What, what, what does that take? What does that require? Yeah. At first desire, it requires us to decide exactly what we want. What we want, uh, what role do we want Iran to play in the region? What do we want the relationship between Iraq and Iran? We're not going to be able to dictate it, but, but we'll have some impact on it. Do we want the government of Bashar al-Assad to survive? And if it doesn't survive, if, for example, that government is destroyed, as we said, as our policy, then the entire part of the Syrian uh, population that supports him, the Alawites, the Druze, the Christian, some of the sort of middle class Sunnis, they don't think they have any other option. They are, he's, he's the port in the storm. And so if you suddenly were to take away that, then I think that they would be in a position of abject fear. And they would either break into small, enclaves and try to survive in what would look like a pretty dangerous environment for them, or they would seek other help from Russia, from Iran, or whatever. So I think we have to think about the post after each move uh, happens. I think we're going to need to get some kind of negotiated settlement in Syria, which means we need to have not let it atomize. If we let it atomize, then it's going to be very hard to put together. So we're going to need to get something where we can create a situation where the government of Syria, whether it's led by Bashar al-Assad or someone else, in a position where they have to negotiate with a credible opposition, which is not yet really uh, strong enough, get a negotiated settlement. Because if there's a winner or a loser, there's going to be, this, I think, this atomization. If you can get a negotiated settlement, you're still going to need 10 or 20 years of nation building. And you know, a lot of people in America says, we don't do nation building anymore. And I say, well, somebody's going to rebuild Syria. It's been destroyed for three years. Someone in the world is going to have to step in and help Syria <coughs> rebuild, or we're going to end up with this cesspool of uh, fear and hopelessness that's going to bring more stuff forward. I think 24% of uh, Jordan's population right now are Syrian refugees. 20% 20, 20 of Lebanon's population are Syrian refugees. So now think of the stability of those states. If we had 24%, I think it'd be 80 some million people. If we brought 80 some million Syrians and put them in the US, it would be slightly destabilizing. So we need to look regionally at the impact of that. So if we let Syria collapse and we let Syria be this, this wasteland, not just Syria will pay the cost for that. But you can see why nation building has gotten sort of a bad flavor. We've had some tough times where that's hard to do and yeah. unintended consequences. I mean, right. so if I'm hearing you right, you're saying, too bad, we've got to do it anyways. I, that's my take. I, I can't think of another way. People say, well, you know, in the good old days of like World War II, we just went, we pounded the enemy and we didn't do counterinsurgency or nation building. Of course we did. We did it after the war. We spent 10 years or so rebuilding Europe. And that was a form of counterinsurgency because we were preventing things we didn't want to have rise. I mean, that's, I just think that's the way the world's going to be. And we might not like it, but that's it. I mean, the argument against that, of course, is that Europe had a democratic tradition. And yeah. they're easier to, to do this in than, than, oh, yeah. than Syria. And, and I, I, if just reading the newspapers, you can see a, a, a strong sentiment in the United States of. Enough. We're just not going to. We're not so politically. 
I mean, maybe even if it's the right thing to do, I'm not absolutely sure you can get the politics of this to spend the money to invest the troops. Uh, I agree. Uh, what are the chances, I think one thing that people are concerned about is that we're going to get sucked in to putting troops on the ground again. What, what would precipitate that? How likely is that? How feasible is that? Well, if, if you were a student of history, uh, as I know you are and, and probably everybody here is, it, you don't typically make the decision right up front, we're going to put a bunch of troops on the ground because that doesn't feel good. If we go back to places like Vietnam, we initially provided assistance to the government of South Vietnam. Then we provided advisors, we provided air power, and then when that didn't work, we provided medevac and we flew South Vietnamese forces. Then we put American forces in to secure enclaves like Da Nang and whatnot. And so what happens is you make a policy and you hit this Rubicon when what you've said, right now our stated policy, as I understand it, is degrade and destroy ISIS. But we are not going to put troops on the ground. We're going to use air power. Okay, if we use air power and we are not achieving that objective, then you have that decision. You're gonna change one of two things. You're either gonna change your objective and says, I'm not gonna do that, we are not gonna do that, or we're gonna do something more, which may be troops on the ground. It doesn't mean that policymakers wanna do it or plan to do it, you just hit that point when what you're doing isn't achieving your objective, you're in that position of changing one or the other. Then typically it's, it's a step to say, well, we'll do some forces on the ground. And then if that doesn't work, we'll do more. It doesn't make it wrong, because sometimes that's the right answer. That's what you have to do. But it's a very understandable progression. progression. I mean, it's sort of, if you have a tragic view of it, isn't kind of inevitable? Uh, maybe inevitable is too strong. But isn't there going to be an impetus? I mean, that the airstrikes are not going to work? there's gonna be some possibly homeland strike, maybe not a big thing, but a small thing, something that will precipitate putting troops in on the ground. Yeah, I mean, I'm an army guy. There's always this belief that air power will be dominant. From the end of the First World War, they said World War II, air power would be dominant, wouldn't need people on the ground. Said it in Korea, said it just never right. is. And so you hit that point where, right. what do you do? And maybe our, maybe our partner forces, the Iraqis and Free Syrian Army and others will be up to the task, but maybe they won't. Well, they sure don't sound like it so far. Not yet. Uh, so this raises this whole murky area. There is, a, there is a realm between air power and conventional forces, and it's the realm in which you lived, special operations. So what role can, can special forces, special operations play in this? Special Operations Forces, which is a, a swath that runs from Green Berets and SEALs to the very high-end counter-terrorist forces, um, you can do several things. One, you can go in and work with the people. You can work with forces. You can build relationships. You can build host nation <coughs> capability. And it can be really effective. And it can be very um, e e economical for us and also leave a light footprint. If you send the right kind of people in, as many of our special forces, A-teams are, they can leverage the capabilities that exist. So that's one end of it. The other end is direct action. <coughs> and that's the part that I spent most of my career in. Those uh, forces have the ability to do very precise intelligence-driven strikes against targets and build more intelligence from that and, and go. And, and inside Iraq, we had a tremendous amount of success for a number of years because we literally built a machine that ate up intelligence and then produced action on a, on a uh, pace that probably never been seen before. Now, that's very effective, but there were some pretty special conditions in Iraq at that time. We had a pretty big footprint. We had support around it. We had a very focused effort. Uh, if you start to think that special operations is just a cheaper way to do big things, you're going to be sadly disappointed. Because special operations is not better operations. It's special. And so they are for unique things. And so the danger is if we start to think that every special operator is, you know, this super person who can do amazing things, that's just not true. They're very, very good. But you've got to use them for what they're good at. It's got to be complemented by a good strategy and typically by operations of conventional forces that 
Well, we've all seen too many movies, and I, I assume presidents have as well. And the, the assumption is if we could just drop the seals on something, it'll all be okay. You know, <laughs> they did get Bin Laden, so there are some historians. Right. And that got Zarqawi. You did. Uh, but so how do you educate uh, policymakers uh, into these realities? Yeah. Um, if you look at the start of many administrations, the, the administration becomes enamored with covert operations initially. You know, intelligence-driven covert operations. And they do that because it's a silver bullet solution to a naughty problem. Someone comes in and tells you, you got this problem here. We can either do this big long-term thing or we can do this very focused covert operation. No one will ever know about it and it will be remarkably effective. <laughs> Which, yeah. it's not always effective and everybody knows about it before it all <laughs> And so pretty quickly they learn that that's not that's not a civil bullet. Special operations are the same way. Routinely, I would be asked, and I know my successors have been asked, is this a high risk operation? And we'd say, it's a very high risk operation. And then we go do the operation and we do it and we'd be successful. And then they, there's a danger that policymakers will start to think high risk means, okay, let's do it. The movie will be good. That's right. But in reality, high risk means high risk of failure. And so, uh, when things would go bad, every once in a while I'd be in situations where we had some that didn't go well, and you have this just violent response. You know, you said, you didn't tell me this. We had a firefight one time on one of these, and you know, literally this waterfall came on my head, and they said, you didn't tell me this was gonna happen. We said, well, what about high risk wasn't clear? <laughs> um, but, but that is partly the response of responsibility of the force, and over time, policymakers, we need to be very upfront with them. We need to be brutally honest. We need to be brutally honest with ourselves. So this is a leadership question, actually. You're a military leader, and you're dealing with civilian leaders. And on the one hand, you want to salute and say, can do, and yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, I'll do what you say. But on the other hand, you've got to educate them. So talk to us about that balance in your own, if you can, draw on your own experience. Um, when you're talking about civilian and military uh, leadership working together, they have to. If you go back to team of rivals during the Civil War, President Lincoln had some military experience but no combat. And so when he took over the biggest military operation in American history to date, he didn't know what he was doing as commander in chief. His generals had a certain amount of hubris because they'd come out of the Mexican War. They were professionals. And so you had these two worlds, one saying, just tell us what to do. We got it. You're an amateur. And the other saying, I don't know how much I ought to be involved. And that's a typical start point to civil military operations. And nowadays, particularly because we have a very low level of veteran representation in civilian party government, there's not that shared experience. You know, President Kennedy had the Navy Cross from the Second World War. I mean, and even so, his experience from the Bay of Pigs and then later from the Cuban Missile Crisis, both, yeah. you know, left him a little bit jaded or a little bit skeptical, <coughs> which was good. But you take people who grow up in different worlds, military grow up in their world, we speak our language, we hang out with our friends, civilians grow up in their world, and then suddenly you come together and you say, well, we're all work for the US government now, we'll all be a team. And you sit down at the same table, you speak English, but you're not speaking the same language, you don't know each other, you didn't grow up together, there's no trust through shared experience. In fact, there's a little bit of skepticism because people on the one side have read about, you know, you know, people in the military have read the book Game Change and they're going, look at these guys. And then <laughs> they've read books, Dereliction of Duty, and about you know, the, the Joint Chiefs, and they're going, look at these guys, we can't trust them because look what happened in Vietnam. And so you come with a certain amount of baggage, whether you intend to or not. You come with a certain amount of baggage and then you start to work together. And as, for example, at the beginning of President Obama's administration, uh, I was on the Joint Staff. I'd, I'd come in, I was the director, chief of staff for the Joint Staff. And they had the end of the last few months of President Bush administration and you had to take over the President Obama and that was all fine. And there was a request on the table for forces for Afghanistan that dated back to the summer of 2008 from General McKiernan. And he had said, I need, I think, 32 or 34,000 more troops. And the decision is made to not to act on that until after President Bush gave up power because they didn't want to you know, make decisions for his successor. So that, that uh, 
was tabled, essentially. The election occurred, and then President Obama wasn't uh, obviously inaugurated until January. Well, this 30-some thousand troops was for security for the elections in August. So if you wanted those 30-some thousand troops to help secure the elections in Afghanistan, you needed to get them over there quickly. And it takes a little while to move 30-some thousand troops. So you wait until President Obama gets inaugurated, and then I think the day after he gets inaugurated, he sits at his desk and someone says, 32,000 troops, please. And he's going, oh, wait a minute. And nobody, I'm not giving the exact words, but sort of the implication is we, we listened in the campaign and you said Afghanistan was the essential war, 32,000 troops, please. And the president goes, wow, I need time to study this. And you go, don't we all? Elections in August, <laughs> got to have the troops now. And so with good intentions on the part of DOD and everybody trying to do the right thing, suddenly the new administration is put with this thing that seems like, holy crows, you're taking advantage of a young president, a new administration, you're trying to steamroll over troops. I'm in the Pentagon, we don't see it at all that way. We see it as, okay, we've been patient waiting, but if we're gonna do what he has publicly said he wants done, we gotta do this. So there's this thing, and, and they say, uh, okay, not 32,000, 17,000. Okay, approve 17,000, and we'll go back for the others later. But then he, the, the decision comes 17,000, which is, I think, they said three brigades. And we go back and say, well, three brigades don't equal 17,000, they actually equal 21,000, because enablers support. And so people go, wait a minute, we said 17,000. Well, the Pentagon heard three brigades, which we need 21, some of the people in the White House here are 17, and so you start this, this trust thing. Hey, you're trying to pull a fast one over on us. And the Pentagon said, no, we're not. And I, from the Pentagon side, I know we weren't, but I absolutely understand <clears throat> how the perception comes and the pressure. And so right from the very beginning of the administration, you start to have this pressure that is viewed as a power play, which I'll tell you, absolutely was not. Could that have been better dealt with as you look back on it, if there had been a more <coughs> direct or intimate, uh, if you'd had an audience, I don't know if, you, well you become ISAF in this period. Yeah, uh, but, yeah right. but the question is, could this have been better dealt with if there was a more direct personal interaction between the president and the relevant military leader? Yeah, um, you know I joke about this and I told some people earlier, the thing now in the benefit of hindsight, what we should have done is right after the election is we should have gotten key players together, about 20, and gone whitewater rafting. And we should have taken, you know, like 12 cases of beer. And, you know, Richard Holbrook and Secretary Clinton, and, and, and I'm not being facetious. Yeah. You didn't know each other. You didn't have those relationships, not just between the military and things, but in the new administration. You've got the campaign team for President Obama, and then you've got Secretary Clinton, you've got Secretary Gates, you've got people who weren't part of that, they needed to bond, and you can't bond around the situation room table. It's too stilted, and you can't bond when you're making decisions about life and death on people in Afghanistan. I think we literally would be better to go create something where you start to get some personal bonds upon which you can build tough decisions. Is that realistic? Well, you know, we laugh at it, and I said, how many people did we lose in Afghanistan. And yeah, I think it is realistic. I think you just say stop, maybe not white water after me. Go somewhere, get coaches, organizational coaches, and beat the team into as much of a team as you can because it's just too important to go at this ad hoc. But there is a tension, it seems to me, for a military, for an officer who is supposed to obey the civilian leadership, but at the same time be honest with the civilian leadership and I don't know, what, when you cross the line from honesty to insubordination, or how did you deal with that yourself? Well, there's two levels. One is, it's pretty straightforward. You are, by oath, required to provide your best military advice, and that means your honest opinion. So when someone asks you your best military advice, that's pretty straightforward, and I think most military officers don't have a problem with telling people what they don't want to hear in that realm. But you know, there is a sense of team, too. 
If you've ever been into a football huddle to a group where you're trying to get something done and everybody goes in there and you're a receiver and the quarterback says, okay, we're going to run up the middle, but you really think that you can get free and uh, you can be in position, you want to go, hey, we need to do this. But there's a certain, there are informal dynamics that affect every group. And at certain times it says, okay, so we're going to do. And so you want to be on the team because if you're the squeaky wheel too much, you start to, to be the squeaky wheel. And so I think that happens in every organization, not just a military state, but internal to that. And um, it can stifle sometimes the need to have really important candor. In your ex personal experience, was there candor between the civilian <laughs> and, the, and the military or no? I think there was a lot of candor. Um, I know at certain times there was uh, absolutely straightforward. What I don't think there was enough in my personal experience was maybe it's a step beyond candor. Like if you and I sit here, Evan, and you ask me some question, I can tell you absolutely the truth. But there's also a step beyond this when you go, okay, everybody relax. What are we really talking about here? And I didn't see that next stage of conversation really there. I think that's important. Because my impression of the history books are they're full of that, that kind of conversation where they really didn't get to the next step and there were misunderstandings and I mean, enough unintended consequences anyways. Uh, let me ask you, uh, uh, before I, I want to get back to the leadership question, but just to return to one second to uh, dealing with ISIS, there's one thing I wanted to ask you about. The rule is that we're not allowed to assassinate foreign leaders. I believe that's still right. the rule. Does that mean that we couldn't kill a guy who calls himself the Caliph? That we couldn't kill El Baghdadi? Is he a foreign leader? Um, I don't know the latest legal ruling, but I, I'm pretty sure he's not. And I'm pretty sure that he is on uh, uh, an approved target list. So my guess is that if they, they located him, they'd have the authority to kill him. I mean, are there sort of tricky fine line issues here? I mean, there is a reason we got out of the assassination business. Yeah. And is there a slippery slope that can get us, especially when we're dealing with these not nation states, but kind of weird semi cowls whatever the hell they want to call themselves? I mean, how do you, how do you parse that? Yeah, I, I think there is. I think you've got to be constantly watching that because at a certain point, if they, they take over all the trappings of statehood, they may not be a Westphalian state in the traditional model, but uh, if they become something and you are doing something where you're reaching in and assassinating the head of a, an organization like that, you got to be a, a bit careful because you could justify in your own mind. They have been classified as a terrorist organization. They have declared that they are in absolute war with us. Um, so I think we're still in pretty good shape with uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, but I don't, I don't dismiss the importance of constantly relooking. I mean, my impression is that, that uh, on the drone strikes, Obama spends a lot of time sorting out what to hit and what not to hit and says no sometimes if there's going to be collateral damage. I mean, he's making value judgments here about the pluses and minuses. Uh, were you ever engaged in this kind of conversation with the chief executive about who to kill and who not to kill? And did you get into that? Uh, with President Bush, but not, never with President Obama. I had gone out of the counterterrorist business um, and I had by the time President Obama came in. Um, you have very serious conversations about that. And usually not with the President, but sometimes with the President. And, and there's some missions that you have to go all the way up to the White House. You have to brief. First, make the justification for the operation that could result in the, the death or capture of the person. And then, of course, all the other implications of it. If there's a possibility of collateral damage, if there's an impact on a nation's sovereignty, all those things. I never saw those strikes done without just kind of extraordinary care. I actually think the American people would be very, very impressed if they saw the level of meticulous care that has been taken on everyone I ever saw and I was involved for quite a long time. And if you were a, a senior officer and the president gave you uh, an order to take out somebody and you thought there was gonna be collateral damage and you disagree with his order, what would you do? Um, yeah, I, I, I'd have to get a lot more specific. First, if I would tell him I disagreed. If I thought that there was an operation where we were giving needless collateral damage, we're, we're going to kill a bunch of civilians, do something like that. 
then I would clearly you know, tell the president that I, I think this is the wrong thing to do, the wrong way to do it. If I thought it was illegal, if I thought we were making an illegal judgment and we were putting uh, operational concerns ahead of the law of armed conflict or ahead of moral law, those are the kinds of things I could see a leader might have to resign over. Uh, if I just disagreed with the strategy, that's different. But if I, if I actually thought we were violating, I wouldn't do an illegal act anyway. I'd go back and tell him, but, but those are the kinds of things where you might have to stand up and say, I, I can't be part of it. And you mentioned dereliction of duty, uh, which is my recollection of the book about in the Vietnam War how the senior military was, the dereliction was that they didn't stand up to the civilians and say, no, or we need to do otherwise. Do you think that atmosphere has improved since, I mean, do you think the, the, the senior military is more willing, more able, more capable of standing up or being honest and direct with the senior uh, civilian leadership? I think it goes up and down. I saw cases where I thought that uh, the senior military leadership did very well, and I saw cases where I thought we didn't. And before the invasion of Iraq, I was um, disappointed that senior military leadership, I don't think, articulated concerns well enough. That they had, concerns that they had amongst themselves, but did not articulate to the executive. Yeah, and I, that's my feeling. Um, there may have been some private things. I was a two-star at the time, so I wasn't at every thing. But I did not get the sense that some of the difficult conversations that needed to be had were had. And I think that's one of those things that senior military leadership, you know, it changes every few years, you got new people in. So it's not like the same people who learn from previous things and then get a chance to redo it. Everybody sort of gets one shot at it, where a big moment comes and you're, you're in that kind of decision. I think that's a case where uh, there's gotta be a lot of introspection because they never unfold exactly as you think they will. The situation's always a bit different from what you studied. And you gotta be able to step back and say, wait a minute, I'm in one of those moments and we are about to make or fail to make a position that uh, needs to be done. Can, can, let me ask you a broad question. Like, do you, can you teach leadership or do you have to do it to learn how to do it? Yeah, I, usually I'm asked if you could teach it, you have to be born with it. Um, I think you can teach the principles of leadership but I think you have to lead to be proficient at it. I don't think that a theoretical understanding of leadership necessarily translates to be an effective leader. I think usually people have to be taught certain things, but most of it comes from you know, trial and error, what works for you, what you're good at, the, the contextual environment you're in. I mean, you, you teach leadership, but at, you know, how, how do you do it without the actual experience? At West Point, you actually did it, right? That's how they teach it, is you do it. At Yale, they don't do it, presumably, so how do you? Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, Yale is, they all do it beautifully. Um, <clears throat> no, uh, that, that's, a, that's a challenge, because West Point does create an environment where you're put in a series of leadership positions and increasing complexity. Parallel to that, they're teaching you the theory of it. What I do at Yale is I use case studies, and I use business, politics, military, <coughs> and whatnot. We do some simulations, but you can only do a certain amount of simulation. But the idea and sort of the thesis of my course is two plus two does not equal four, which reflects my math background. Um, <laughs> but the theory that I was taught this many years ago, believe it or not, by Les Gelb, and uh, he said in a room in DC, two plus two does not equal four, it equals what the people in the room decided equals. And that's true. And so your ability to influence other people, your ability to, to build on relationships and credibility and all that is actually more important than having the right answer. And so I think that just being clever doesn't make you a great leader. Being, have a high emotional IQ, I think, or EQ, I think is more important. I mean, one issue, uh, leadership issue, it seems to me that you make in front of Yale or Princeton or any of these places is that uh, uh, young people who have been taught to sell themselves, to brand themselves, to not be modest about their achievements. Uh, uh, that, I'm painting with a broad brush here, but, but it's a cultural, cultural issue. Uh, I mean, do you deal with that at all when you, when you talk to these future young uh, leaders uh, about the issue of modesty and humility and how to make that happen? Yeah, we actually talk a lot about that because it is very contradictory. On the one hand, 
I think the best leaders have a good dose of humility. They may have self-confidence underneath, but they, they need to be humble about what they're not because nobody's as, as good as they'd like to be. But yet we have an age where the better your resume is, the better your ability to sell yourself. We require political candidates. Now, as you know, a hundred and some years ago, people running for president didn't campaign. That was considered unseemly. Nowadays, you've got to go out and sell yourself like a bar of soap. And that is, that's really difficult to keep that balance between trying to you know, blow your own horn and at the same time having the humility. Because if you're leading people and you don't have the humility to understand that you work for them, you are their servant, then you can quickly forget what this is all about. And so how do you gain, in a, in a world of, of resume building and selling yourself, how do you gain, how do you gain humility? Yeah. Um, it's a great point, particularly if you're in a position where everybody has got a Josh March on Certainly the case here. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, we use the case studies. We do a lot of introspection. We do a lot of talking in the course, but it's only one course. I don't kid myself um, that you can change a person's whole life. I think there have got to be a number of experiences you have. I think organizations, athletics and all, give you opportunities to get a, a good sense of just what you are and what you are not and what you can try to, to build on. I know you're in favor of national service, uh, which is, I think is relevant to all of us, right? I mean, talk a little bit about that. How, how yeah, I, I, I appreciate that opportunity. About two and a half years ago, I gave a talk out at Aspen, and at the end of it, I was asked a question whether I believed that we needed a military draft, and I said, I believe we do. And I said, not because we need more soldiers, or that not because we don't have great soldiers, but because I believe all America should be represented in service to the nation. And I said, but that's really not the right question. The right question is, do I believe in national service for all young Americans? And I do, and here's why. I think the concept of citizenship in America has eroded. I think a lot of people think that if I pay my taxes and I vote, I have done what it is to be a citizen. But when I think of citizenship, I think of membership in a country that's a covenant between people. It's just a group of people came together and said, we'll be a country. We will take care of each other. We have a shared responsibility for each other. And so my view is citizenship in America needs to be something that grows inside people in a way that makes you feel like you are invested in the overall enterprise. Doesn't mean you all agree on everything. It means you're invested in this very concept of what we are. I don't know a better way to build that sense of investment than contribution to it. You know, whenever I pick up trash somewhere, I don't like people who litter there. Whenever I've worked on something, I have a different feeling toward it. I care more about my own kid than I did about the kid next door because I was invested in that kid. Um, I believe that if we can create an opportunity for every young American to do a year of national service, a service year, we call it, paid for a year in conservation, health care, education, military, anything, that they will have a shared sense of accomplishment and they will leave with a better connection to their fellow Americans, not just from their zip code, that will change the concept of citizenship in America and strengthen the country. I think it's the essential way that we can help move ourselves back away from, you know, what I consider a weakened sense of citizenship and some of the polarization that's uh, attacking us now. So we're the Franklin Project of the Aspen Institute. Uh, politically, how are you doing on that? We are trying to stay completely nonpartisan. So we have talked to a number of political leaders. We're getting support from people, but we don't want either side to own it because we don't want the other side to be against it because one side's for it. We think this needs to come from Americans. Uh, young people want to do it. Just for a number, there were 80,000 positions for AmeriCorps in 20, 2012. 40% part-time, 40% full-time. There were 580,000 young people who applied for those 80,000 positions. There were 5,000 Teach for America positions. There were more than 50,000 applications for those. The demand of young people's there. What we as the older generation, most of us, need to do is give them an opportunity and they need some help getting the opportunity. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, all of you in just one second, but I wanna ask you about a last thing. 
Uh, your career ended uh, dealing with a journalist. I want you to describe that, if you would, and what you learned from it. Sure. Um, most of you will remember that. Um, I was commanding in Afghanistan, and we had a number of embeds. That's when employer, our reporter comes and spends time with you. And we had a, a bunch of them. And we had one from Rolling Stone who was there for two or three short periods. And uh, I didn't get to know him well, but I got to, to see him and whatnot. But I do remember we were, we'd been asked to go to Germany, Britain, Czechoslovakia, and Poland to talk to their leadership because there was waning support for the war in Afghanistan. And those countries' leadership asked the commander in Afghanistan to go talk and give him justification for it. So we did that. Uh, and he linked up with us during part of the trip. And uh, at one point, on my 33rd wedding anniversary, I took my wife to dinner. She, had, she flew over and met us. I took my wife to dinner, and then after dinner, we came back to the hotel, and a guy said, hey, part of the team's around the corner at an Irish bar. Would you join them? Sure. So we walked around there with the team. I had an Afghan officer, uh, two British officers, a French <laughs> officer, a German officer, two or three Americans, and, and, and that's, that was the team. And the reporter was there. Didn't think about it. When we went home that night, Annie said, I'm really glad that reporter was there tonight. I said, why? She said, he needed to see that. He needed to see the bonding of a team who'd been at war. Most of us had been at war for five years. Um, she needed, he needed to see that. Okay, that was April. In June, they woke me up in the middle of the night and they said, we got a problem. I said, what? They said, the Rolling Stone article came out. I said, what's the problem with that? that? That guy just saw a team, that's no big deal. They said, it's bad. I said, really? So I went downstairs and I read the article and it was, it really was a depiction of the team as different than I knew my team to be. And it talked about talking about political leaders, vice president and whatnot. And I didn't believe that was an accurate depiction of my team, but I knew that the, the article was going to produce a firestorm. There was already a lot of political tension at the time, June of 2010, the war and all these different things. So I knew it was going to explode. So later that day, I was directed to fly back to the United States, which I did, and go see the Secretary of Defense and the President. En route to that, um, you know, there was no doubt to me what was going to happen here. And I prepared my resignation. And flew in all night and then got there, went home, took a shower, put on my dress uniform, went to the Pentagon, met the Secretary of Defense, talked to him, and the Secretary of Defense says, I don't know what's gonna happen, and I don't think he did. And he said, can you tell me all the background on the story? I told him what I knew, I said, but I, I haven't investigated it. I don't know what's true and what isn't true, but I know that the tone of the truth is not the truth as I know it to be. Um, went over to, uh, to the White House, met with the President. He asked me what I knew and I told him the same thing. I said, hey, listen, what matters now is the war. Here's my resignation. If you want my resignation, that's fine. If you want me to go back and continue to command, that's fine too. Whatever you want, I, I'm happy to do. And he accepted my resignation. Um, so you walk out after 34 years, and in my whole career, I thought I might be fired for incompetence. I thought I might be killed. I never thought I'd be accused of disloyalty. And I knew I wasn't, but I never expected. So it was sort of an out-of-body experience at that point. I mean, I literally was trying to process, okay, what do you do? Um, I went back home, uh, which was just a few minutes away, and Annie was there, and she obviously waiting for me to get back. And I, I walked in and I told her, it's over. We're done. And she looked at me and she said, good. We've always been happy and we'll always be happy. And she never once, I took the uniform off and I put it on again. Um, she never once wavered from that. So what did I learn from it? I learned a number of things. Um, the first was, I don't regret anything that I did in service. I don't regret, I mean, I regret that happened but there's nothing that I feel, okay, we did wrong or whatever. But I also know that 
And some people say, well, why'd you resign? Why didn't you fight it or whatever? Because that's not what the cause needed at that point. And the president didn't need a general causing a controversy and then extending the controversy by fighting it. And so I said, that's, that's not what my mission is supposed to be, whether I think this is fair or not. That's not what I do. <clears throat> and then you process how you deal with it from then on. And you can, you have several opportunities. And the first is, you're angry and you're hurt. I've been wronged. And you can, um, you can sort of grasp onto that and let it get inside your stomach and grow until you're, you know, you're sort of consumed by your bitterness. Or you can say, all right, I can't change the past. What I can do is I can, I can make the future. I can affect the future. So what I decided from that moment on with Annie's great help was to live every day so that when people met me, saw me, interacted with me, if they'd read that article, they'd go, wow, that's not congruent with that. And people who had served with me for many years before, many of whom had placed great faith in me, would say, all right, I knew him before. That wasn't a lie. What, what I see now is what I believed in before. And so that's been the plan. Now, it, you know, it's easy to say. That's hard to do because you do that every day. You don't get up one morning and say, okay, it's behind me. You get up every morning and you say, it's behind me. Every time someone asks you the question, you say, it's behind me. Um, it's, it's a lesson in how many friends come out of the woodwork. It's a lesson in how many people that I knew, some of which I was very close to, some of which I was not as close to, but came out and reached out to me in a way that formed sort of this safety net. So when I fell, instead of hitting the ground, you had this, this elastic net of people who catch you. And it, uh, it makes you incredibly thankful for the people that you, you build those relationships over time and never to take that for granted. So, um, so it, it's good lessons. Good. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take questions from all of you. I think students have the first question. but then uh, uh, we'll engage as many of you as we can. We got about a half an hour uh, left here, so anybody, come to the, please come to the mic, because I think that's the, the forum here, anybody? I'm sure some of you have a question for gentlemen. Yes, ma'am. Yes, it's okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, General, for your very insightful talk. <laughs> Our recent poll, can you, everyone hear me? Why don't you put it down? I'm kind of short. <laughs> um, recent polls indicate that Americans would like a future president to have a military background. Um, as a president, you would not have to have the training that other uh, presidents have needed. Would you consider uh, running for president <laughs> of the United States? Started yeah. here. <laughs> no, I. But that's very kind. Um, no, I. I wouldn't. Uh, I'm self-aware enough, I think, to know what I'm good at and what I'm not good at, and I don't think I'd be good at that. Um, and watching the, the process, I know I would enjoy it. So. But what, what are the pluses and minuses of a military man becoming president? Yeah, um, it's not a great track record. If you look back, there have been a number of military guys. Some have done well. Others have, have not produced as good a background or good a track record. Ulysses S. Grant and whatnot. I don't think it's a, it's a huge qualifier or not. I do think there's a discipline to it. I think there's an organizational background that's very helpful. Um, a governor often has someone like that. What you lack is any experience dealing with legislatures, Congress, that sort of thing. And I think that there's a uh, I think the lack of that would be one of the shortcomings you'd have to deal with. Uh, 
over the last couple of weeks, the uh, founder of Blackwater has been on a, on a book circuit, and he's been uh, giving interviews. And uh, in the interview, um, he's extolling the virtue of contractors. Um, one, making the point that maybe that meets the president's commitment not to put American boots on the ground. But bigger, the bigger uh, point is how great uh, contractors are, how great their training is, how cheap it is to use contractors. So I'm, I'm wondering what your opinion is of, of contractors and, and uh, the other question about the commitment. Yes, sir. Um, I'm really strongly against that. Um, there are contractors that need to be in the, in the war zone. They're maintenance people and, and things like that that bring special expertise that support the force. I am strongly against contractors in a military-like carrying a weapon role. And here's why I'm against it. You can have great people, but it starts to move a little bit toward mercenaries. The reality is, if, you, if we care enough to fight a war, we care enough to put our sons and daughters in uniform and harm's way, that's what we should do. The danger, I think, is if you have mercenaries, you almost lower the threshold. Well, we're willing to go fight because we're going to send mercenaries. Also, people who are in that uh, situation, even though they can be great human beings, they're not fighting for the same thing. Ultimately, they're fighting for money, and that's not the same, and they don't have the same uniform code of military justice and, and whatnot. So I think that's a slippery slope we need to back away from. In fact, we've done more of that than I would like to see, and I would be violently against us doing it uh, in the future. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, so going back to leadership with respect to um, po policy making when it comes to dealing with um, ISIL or ISIS as well as other um, concerns that we have as a nation, I was wondering if you can speak a little bit about how um, both military and civilian leaders can um, deal with the trade-offs associated with continuing to um, deal with the Middle East and the nation building that you talked is necessary for, um, for those, um, for that to work with other concerns such as our continued desire to pivot to Asia but never actually um, successfully completing that pivot. No, it, it's a great uh, question. One of the dangers of uh, leadership in an endeavor like this is to do it by steps. It's to do it by, okay, we'll do this, and not really talking to the American people about what's going to happen after this, after this, after this. One of the beauties of a big existential fight like World War II is early we were able to say, we are going to defeat the Empire of Japan and Germany, and then we're going to deal with those nations after their occupied. So everybody sort of knew the beginning, military, middle, and the end, and they could calculate the cost. Um, if we look at the Middle East right now and we say we're going to do this task, and we, don't, we aren't honest either with ourselves or with uh, our population, that there's a task after that, then we run the risk of sort of like when you're running a race and you run a mile and someone says, oh, one more mile. I think we've got to be really honest with ourselves as we go three and four steps out. And in the Mideast, those three or four steps aren't clear. So we, we can't say capture Berlin and the war's over. But what we can say is the situation is difficult enough. It's very unlikely we're going to be able to do little or nothing in those years ahead. So it's particularly hard right now for any leadership to navigate the Mideast. I just think that it's pretty clear that uh, unless we're willing to step away, do nothing, and just let things collapse, which I, I just don't find plausible, that we need to, to uh, describe some kind of sets of at least desired in state that, we're willing, that we are trying to move toward. Uh, it's a real communication issue as well as developing a strategy issue. And I, I can't imagine many leaders look forward to doing that. But I, this is one of those unique times I think we have to. Thanks. Sure. Um, if I might steal a couple of questions, actually. The first would be uh, following uh, the withdrawal from Iraq and, and the circumstances that we find ourselves in these days. Um, Afghanistan is, is looking at a withdrawal situation in, in the coming couple of years. 
what would be your advice? What would be your, your, your sentiment of lessons learned from Iraq? What might be applied to Afghanistan, uh, whether or not Afghanistan is facing another ISIS situation? And then the second question I've got is um, uh, your experience in Afghanistan with working with international NGOs. I, I was used to be a member of, of Doctors Without Borders. I spent a lot of time in Afghanistan, but a long time ago, not during the period of the last 10 years or so. Um, and I was curious to, to, to understand your concept of the evolution of the relationship between the NATO forces and, and the international NGOs. Sure. Um, the, the way ahead in Afghanistan is based on Iraq or Afghan confidence. What Afghanistan needs is confidence. It's been 35 years at war. They've been through, you name it, war with the Soviets, civil war, war with the Taliban, then uh, what we've done the last uh, decade. The people of Afghanistan haven't seen a good, strong, workable governance in the lifetime of both Afghans. And they haven't seen uh, the kinds of uh, political accommodation by their leaders in most of their lifetime, some maybe when they were very young. They're not confident that that can happen, and they are convinced that <coughs> Pakistani in interference inside their country will keep them churned up. So there's, the lack of confidence is what I came away with was the biggest problem. And when you have no confidence, think about it. If you think the grocery store is going to close tomorrow for the next month, everybody rushes out tonight, and there's a rush on all the milk and, and all the bread and whatnot. Afghanistan's a little like that for the last 30 years. So everybody is trying to get what they can. They're trying to protect their family, their smaller organizations. You don't get a workable society until people are confident and they trust each other and they, they trust institutions. That's what they need. My, my sense that if the United States does what President Obama said he was going to do, which was a strategic partnership with Afghanistan for the future, it doesn't have to be many, many people. I do think there has to be a residual U.S. force of some number of thousands. But that's more symbolic of the partnership. That's more a guarantee that says, we're here. We're your partners. If something happens, an existential threat, we're with you. Um, if we can do that, then I think the Afghan people have the ability. They have the, the will. They're going to have to continue to improve their governance. But they have the capacity to move forward. If they, if they can't get that confidence maintained, then I think uh, it's, it's much more difficult. So that's the lesson from Iraq. When we completely left Iraq, I think different situation, but it allowed the Maliki government to do some things that undermined Sunni confidence and, and things went badly from there. On NGOs, of course, you know, unbelievable work by brave people. There is a challenge sometimes that non-government organizations and a, a wider effort get it cross purposes. You know, the NGOs will say, well, we're completely impartial. We got to do what we do. We can't be aligned with anybody. And, and I, I respect that. But sometimes it can make the organizations working together actually can work, uh, can make each other le less efficient. I'm not sure I have the perfect solution to it, but they do need to talk more. And they need to interact more. It doesn't mean one works for the other or they allied, but I think that this idea that we'll, we'll stay as far away as we can to as we don't get tainted is just not practical. You're in the same place, you're, you're dealing with the same people, and what each does affects the other, and we all just want Afghanistan to come out right, uh, I think. Is that fair? Thank you, sir. Thanks very much. Ma'am. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. I think that whenever we can, we need to be part of a coalition. Now, clearly, in many cases, the other members of the coalition won't have the same military capacity that the US does. We will have more force, or we will have different higher tech things than our partners will have. And that can put stresses and strains, because in some cases, our modern fighter aircraft won't interact with uh, older models by other aircraft, so you can't fly in formation together. So it just it makes it harder and so if you say, well, let's be most efficient, let's just not have them, we'll do it ourselves. In the long run, that's less effective and less efficient. As long as we are a multi-nation coalition, one, it's, it's unlikely we're going to be perceived as 
an organization that's trying to conquer or be imperialist or something, because we're not. And second, the more people who buy in, the more chances you're going to have a, a uh, multi-perspective approach to this thing. You know, people bring just different views of it. And I think that, that that's really important for us as well as the other nations. Although, again, it's, as I say, it's sometimes more complex to do it that way. I'd only go unilaterally if there's no other choice. And, uh, you know, that would be a very small number of cases, I think, nowadays. Uh, I'd really pressure allies in almost every in the world that, you know, if we're going to go, at least be symbolically there. Thank you. I'd like to follow up on that. Uh, you talked about being in the middle of the coalition um, at the 50,000 foot level. Why is it that we have to bear such a disproportionate share of responsibility when we have European countries and other countries around the world with resources and interests that should play as well? What have we done wrong to allow that vacuum to occur? Yeah. Um, I, I guess there are a lot of arguments. Clearly, I think the European most of the European nations have underfunded defense for quite a while. And they've underfunded defense because, particularly with the fall of the Soviet Union, it looked like any existential threat to them was not apparent. Also, the reality is the United States was there, and there was a sense that they could accept risk because uh, the US had this capacity. I think Libya certainly shined a light on that. Afghanistan has shown a light on that in cases. Some of the nations were short capacity that they, they really wish they had. <clears throat> I think we've got to continue to pressure our allies to make a reasonable expenditure investment in defensive capability. Can't just automatically rely, well, will do it. But that takes <coughs> sort of subtle political pressure. Uh, and, and we, ever since the fall of the, the wall, I think it's been harder to make that. I think Putin may be making that easier uh, he's certainly given a certain rationale for it, but I haven't seen great action yet. Thanks. Um, yeah. Changing the discussion for a minute. Um, an infantryman who was recently named a sergeant in the U.S. Army. Do you think that's too much power too soon? Or is it a positive thing, in a sense, for the Army? To be a sergeant? Yes, an infantryman. To oh, the sergeant major of the Army. That the Sorry, what's, what's the question? Um, an infantryman was recently appointed to the position of a sergeant in the U.S. Army. Is that too much power too soon, or is it a plus? Well, it happens all the time. I mean, I'm sorry. You mean it? They just made an infantryman the sergeant major of the Army, right. the senior non-commissioned for the Army. I think that's a natural evolution of superior beings, because I was an infantryman. <laughs> <laughs> people about a B minus, and, and here's why I would. I think for personal generosity and for the willingness to fund the Veterans Administration and whatnot, they deserve an A. Individuals do great things. The Veterans Administration is well funded. And nobody complains about funding that. I think I would give us a lower grade, all of us, for a couple of things. One is we're not, it's a problem that's over there. It's a problem with veterans, but in the Civil War, one out of every 68 Americans was wounded. Everybody knew somebody was wounded in your family, in your town, in your village, whatever. Now it's something like one out of every 7,300. So most of us don't know anybody wounded. You may know of somebody, but you don't know them. So it's not up close. So I give us a lower grade because we've allowed this to stay a little bit at arm's length. We've contributed money, we've done things. But in reality, when America sends a young person to war, America sends a young person, not your, your son who went. America sent him, you didn't send him. Communities send him. Communities own him when they come home. When they come home, they go into the medical system and then they go into the VA. But in reality, the owner is the community. So for that person, and if he's got a family, 
their well-being, the job they get, just, just integrating them back. Remember, they've been gone four or more years, and they come back different. And we still bear responsibility. And we can't just write a check and say, I hope it's working out. I think we got to have a different mindset about what veterans mean to us. And that may mean we have to go find them. Where are they in our neighborhood? Because they won't walk down Main Street saying, feel sorry for me. I think we've got to, in, at the local level, we've got to find where are our veterans? Do they have jobs? Are they doing OK? If they are, great. If they aren't, let's fix it. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, General McChrystal. I would love to pick your brain. Unfortunately, you're not the first general who was faced with a resignation issue. I would like to ask your opinion about what you thought at the beginning of our decade of war when General Shinseki resigned and also what you think about his request for more troops, I believe it was 400,000. And do you think the Afghan war, for example, would have played out differently had civilians listened? Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Just to refresh everybody, General Shinseki uh, was the chief of staff of the Army. And near the end of his four-year term, they curtailed the term. And in fact, he was retired earlier than planned. Uh, he didn't resign, but he was moved earlier than he planned, which was, it was significant. Uh, in his testimony regarding Iraq at one point, uh, after the invasion, there was starting to be problems with uh, security. He was asked whether there were enough forces there. And General Sinseki's response to the question was, well, based on my experience, particularly in the Balkans, and I do the math on the size of Iraq, size of the population, no, it doesn't appear to me like we have enough. I think you're going to need a bigger force. That became a controversy. There was already a move to, for him to retire early, but that became something that, that got him sort of the ire of uh, Princeton graduate Secretary Rumsfeld. Um, <laughs> and, and that was pretty painful. Uh, in retrospect, he was absolutely right. I mean, he nailed it. There's, there are certain things in war that are, are, are not math, but there are certain things in war that are math. And having enough forces to cover a certain geographical area has got a mathematical certainty to it. And he was really just quoting that. Unfortunately, that ran up against some of the, the preconceived notions by some of the, the uh, decision makers at the point. I think it was unfortunate, but it really gets back to what Evan asked me about earlier. At that point, there wasn't a rich dialogue between some of the senior military leaders and civilian leaders, particularly Secretary Rumsfeld and, and uh, General Shinseki. There wasn't that, that kind of discussion that says, I really think we need more troops. Why? You know, and that sort of thing. And that's the great failing. The fact that that comment gets said in testimony when it hasn't been hashed out between two professionals who are bare, both bear responsibility for it. And so I think that's if we get back to that root interaction and the relationship, then those kinds of things will be few and far between. So, thank you, sir. <coughs> Yeah. Um, I think NATO has lasted much longer than anybody thought it was. It got a new lease on life. I mean, it clearly, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was a sense that NATO was now irrelevant. NATO got itself some new uh, relevance in Afghanistan and, and Libya and whatnot. I, so I think that there's a renewed sense that this alliance makes sense, whether it's not for the same purpose it was, although, you know, theoretically, there may be a requirement for some of that again. But I think people started to see the general goodness of the alliance. I think NATO is, it's a good alliance. But as you remember what Napoleon said, he was asked what enemy he'd most like to fight. He said an alliance. Uh, because alliances are inherently unwieldy and, and inefficient. 
So I think NATO is unwieldy and efficient. I think it's probably more efficient than any other alliances. And I think it forms a foundation upon which you build. And when you go to war, you gotta tighten the screws up on different parts of it. I, I think it's got a little bit lax. So I think that'll have to happen, but I would not be for not keeping it because otherwise you'd have to start from whole cloth if, if we went back. Thank you. This is great. For those of you who are not familiar, the Army has a school, Ranger School. It's about nine weeks long, and they try to see if they can sort of break your spirit. Um, they teach you uh, tactics, but in so doing, they deny you sleep, they deny you food, they do all these sorts of things. And at the end of it, what you come out with, you are a more proficient soldier, but the biggest thing is you have stretched your belief in what you can do because suddenly you know that you can be cold, hungry, lost, frightened. You can do all of that for extended periods of time and still function. And it changes your level of confidence. So whenever someone in the, the military runs into someone else with a ranger tab, you look at the person and even if they are an abject idiot, <laughs> and they, some are, uh, you look at them and you say, well, Everything else aside, that person went through that experience, so they get a certain amount of credibility because you know they did it. More than half of the class quits, so you'll know. So the selection or the completion rate is, is uh, fairly low, but those who make it aren't the smartest, they aren't the strongest, they are the people who've got something inside that says, never quit. And so when you see that, you automatically give them credibility and belief. So, my vote motivation was I wanted to be one of those guys. And from the moment I went there, you know, I, I went in the course and I said, well, it could be, it was winter too and it was, you know, horrible. And so we're cold and all this kind of stuff. And then I said, well, no matter what happens, you know, they can't kill us. <laughs> but then while I'm in the course, tragically, two guys did die from cold. I said, well, maybe they can. <laughs> uh, so, to me, it was just a source of pride, and I, you know, I, of the things you do, I'm probably more proud of that than I am of almost anything I was able to be a part of in my career. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Would you comment on the um, United States-Pakistani relationship, both, both political and military, and what you think needs to be yeah. done to make it less dysfunctional? Yeah. Well, dysfunctional is a, is a pretty good depiction. Complex would be understating the relationship. Um, there's a lack of trust on both sides. If you go back to the history between 1947 and uh, the present, and you put yourself in the Pakistani position, not just the military, but uh, diplomatically, there were a series of times when America let Pakistan down in Pakistan's eyes. There was a, a uh, treaty signed in the 1950s that said if we have a, if you get in a war, we're there for you. Pakistan was in two subsequent wars, and in both cases we said, nah, it doesn't really apply this time. Then when we needed Henry Kissinger to go to China, Pakistan gave the secret capability for us to fly him in. During the Cold War, when the Soviets went into Afghanistan, we used Pakistan as the interlocutor to, to flood weapons and money to the Mujahideen the Soviets kept threatening the Pakistanis that they're gonna come across the border and the Pakistanis are there, you know, accepting that risk of that and, and helping defeat the Soviet uh, invasion of or occupation of Afghanistan. And then at the end of the war, India, which had gotten the nuclear weapon in 1974, I think, uh, and had just done it, Pakistan, was subjected to the Pressler Amendment, which was the only law ever written that was focused against one nation. And it said that if Pakistan cannot guarantee that they're not developing a nuclear weapon, we are gonna do these, impose these sanctions on them, which stopped mill to mill engagement and a number of other things. And so they subsequently set off a nuclear weapon, just as India had done, and we imposed the Pressler Amendment. And Pakistan says, wait a minute, 
We've been your Cold War partner. We've accepted risk. We've done all these things. And now, just when we've run the Soviets out of Afghanistan, and you don't need us anymore, Pressler Amendment, and by the way, you are now out of the region. Now, so from the Pakistani standpoint, when we come back on 2001, we show back up because now there's a problem that we have and we want Pakistan help with, <coughs> Al Qaeda inside Afghanistan. And then ever since then, they have been viewed, I think that they have viewed our effort in Afghanistan as very centric to what we want. We want, F we want Pakistan to support it. We, are, we do violence which increases the unrest on the Pakistani side uh, with their own tribes. So if you take a Pakistani view, and I'm not saying I agree with all that, but if you take a Pakistani view, we are friends that you don't need having. And when we do give them money, they, it's sort of, we better get what we can get now because as soon as we're not of use, we will turn our backs. And therefore, you know, if we don't get our F-16s, we'll be left naked against the uh, Soviets. So that complex relationship they do a lot of things which are contradictory to, to what we want. They support the Taliban. They've supported the Akhani brothers, our Akhani network and whatnot. But it always rests on this bedrock of just mistrust. It's kind of like you're, you're in, but you always keep one foot out, both sides, because as soon as possible, we're going to step back. And that causes bad behavior on both sides. So, I think that we are going to have to get to some place where our horizons are extended, where we say our relationship is longer term than this. It's not what we want today or what you want today because we're each just trying to get what we can, in my view. I do think we need a long term relationship. We just don't have any interest in being in opposition or having <coughs> Pakistan as a rogue state, you know, as a, as a uh, sort of pariah state, and they've got all the problems in the world. They get economic problems, electricity problems, political problems, military problems, two insurgencies. So, I mean, they got this list of problems with not a lot of close allies. And, and to me, that, that makes them more likely to, uh, to be in a difficult position and act in a way we don't want. Long answer. No, we have time for one last quick question. <laughs> the biggest problem is our inability to get stuff done. Not as true inside the military as inside the government. It's one thing to have problems. The nation's always had problems. That's okay. Problems will arise. We haven't been able to address problems. We haven't been able to do good or bad solutions. In the last years, we've kind of done no solutions. And that's much worse than a mediocre solution. And so before we do anything else, this is sort of like before the family goes on a big road trip, we better fix the car. We better make sure it can do basic stuff. I think that there's a lot of people talking about it now, and maybe there'll be movement forward, but we've been a while. I mean, how many years since we passed the budget? I think it's 14. I mean, think about that. So, you know, if we can't do that sort of thing, and again, I don't care whether it's Republican or Democrat, let's just do basic stuff. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, General.